Back to business. Colossians chapter 4. Let's go ahead and turn there. Beginning in verse 7, we're going to work our way to the end of the book tonight. Finish up. It's been, uh, this is our 16th study in the book. So we've taken our time going through, haven't we? But it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing for me to, to learn and, and study through it and pray that it has been for you guys as well. We've been looking at this letter that Paul wrote to the Colossian church when the church was about five years old. And Epaphras, their pastor, who was saved under Paul's ministry there in Ephesus, um, had gone back to Colossae. Uh, uh, Philemon was the other uh, person that we know of that was with him, that both got saved and, and went back to Colossae, started the church. Paul had never been there, but um, uh, Epaphras came and really with great concern in his heart because of some of the cults that had started coming into the area and uh, just wanting his church to have a great foundation, uh, made his way to Rome so that uh, he could get Paul's advice. And uh, the way Paul chose to advise was through this letter, to write this letter and to send it then on to, uh, back to the church. So in chapter 1, we saw that Paul, very impressed with the faithfulness that he had heard from Epaphras of the church there, their love for all the saints, begins to write this letter and really begins with the crux of all of it. And, and, and really the, the capstone, if you will, of this letter is found in chapter 1, verse 18, that he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And indeed, that's as we've gone through the letter, we've seen that that has been Paul's desire to really relate to the Colossians, that Jesus is all in all, that he should be first in everything that we do. And we even met that challenge ourselves as we studied through there. Is Christ indeed first? Because through the rest of chapter 1, he's the one that reconciled us to the Father and certainly the one that's worth not only having in our lives, but a willingness that Paul had to suffer for the sake of Christ and really encouraging the Colossians that they may have to do the same thing, but that it's all absolutely worth it. So that then getting to chapter 2, Paul wanting to refute some of the philosophies and the legalism that was there at the time that the Gnostics were uh, purporting that uh, they should not walk in those things, but walk in the freedom of Christ and then getting to chapter 3 where he really starts getting practical in the application of it, of, of setting your minds, having that mindset that is on the things above, not on the things here on earth, and what it looks like to walk that way. Uh, really, again, the title that we've had for this series is, You Know Him, Now Walk With Him. We all know Him, but are we walking? It, it really relates so nicely to what James says there in his letter about being doers of the word and not hearers only. And it's a good thing for us to kind of do that check, that self-check now and then. And just ask yourself, am I being a doer of the word, not just a hearer? Am I exercising in my daily activities in my life the things of God and, and what he has for me and how he's instructed me, walking in his ways? And so Paul's desire was that that fullness of Christ would be brought into every aspect of our lives, beginning by putting on that new man and then taking that fullness both into our homes and into our workplaces and, as we talked about last week, into our prayer lives to continue earnestly in prayer. So last week we looked through verse 2 and 2 through 6, which really is the last formal teaching that Paul had in the letter. Finishing out, and it's why we're taking this last bit. It's a little bit of a larger chunk than we've taken before, but it really is one continuous thought, and that is Paul now wants to introduce us to his posse. Ten men that are being uh, mentioned here, or maybe you could look at it, it kind of for Paul, it was the Knights of the Round Table for him, those that were supporting him. L let me ask you, do you find yourself by nature... Uh, being a loner? Are you more of an isolated and a loner kind of a person? Or do you find yourself surrounding yourself with people? Do you like to be around people? Uh, I know in our day and age, and especially in our 
uh, demographics where we live here in this packed place, we do have a tendency to kind of isolate ourselves. Uh, it's sad. It's kind of a sad commentary. But they've always said the more you press people together, the less they are going to want to have to do with each other. You, I know that from being a, a, living in an apartment. I lived in an apartment for many years. And it's, it, when you already can hear <laughs> what's going on behind you and to the sides of you and above you, you really don't want to meet those people. You've already heard plenty, you know, the arguments and all of the kind of things and the kids screaming and everything that's going on day and night. Sometimes very late into the night, you're trying to sleep. So, you know, when you bump into each other in the courtyard, it's not like, hey, how you doing? I'm your neighbor. It's like, oh, you're the one. <laughs> and that's sad. Again, I mean, that's, I very often was convicted as, as a Christian. I needed to, to get outside of that thing in my flesh and, and reach out to folks. But it's interesting, if you go out into the Plain States, my daughter now lives in Wyoming, a little place called Pine Bluffs. It has 1,200 people in it. I mean, I think she's met pretty much everybody in town already, and she's only been there six or seven months. But they, because they're more spread apart, because they're living in this kind of small atmosphere, they want to know everybody and are more than happy to get to know everyone in town. You know, they had a, had a rodeo over the summer, and yeah, the entire town showed up, which is pretty good. Everybody's there. So I guess the whole point being is, are we willing to be vulnerable enough to, to reach out to folks, but to have people around us, especially as Christians? Fellowship is so very important. I know it's a blessing to have fellowship with each other, but it's also important. We need each other. That's the way God designed it. And Paul got that. And we'll see tonight that Paul had quite an incredible list of men that were around him constantly. Throughout the gospel, the scholars have figured that Paul probably mentions around 100 people by name in his letters. So he, he knew at least that many. We, he knew probably many more, but by name. And he knew them all by name. And I was talking to a brother before the study about this and, and both mentioned it's, you know, a lot of it's because he prayed for all these people. He, he mentioned them by name in his prayers. So here we're going to get introduced to 10 of them. And these were men of like precious faith. They weren't perfect men by any stretch of the imagination, but they were men that were faithful to Paul and to his ministry and to the ministry of the Lord. It's also interesting that they're representatives of the early church in so many ways. Their names have been read throughout the eons. Even, even tonight as we sit here, we'll once again read these names of these men that lived some 200 or 2,000 years ago. So here, let's go ahead and jump in. This, this, this final greeting that Paul wants to give as he introduces, as I said earlier, his posse, his, his knights of the round table. First is uh, Tychicus, is how we pronounce it. I imagine if you go a little more true to to, uh, to the Latin or the Roman, it would be more like uh, Tychidicus, Tychidicus, something like that. Anyway, we'll stick with Tychicus. That's a little easier. Uh, and we'll call him Tychicus the Faithful, if we're giving him a knight name. Tychicus the Faithful, because certainly he was to Paul. His name actually means fateful. So kind of that idea of, of, of a name that means you have a built-in destiny, I guess. You want to look at it that way, fate. Um, we're introduced to Ty Tychicus for the first time back in the book of Acts. And in chapter 20, verse 4, he's listed with a number of other people that traveled with Paul to Asia Minor. And in that verse it says, And uh, so Peter of Berea accompanied him, uh, accompanied Paul to Asia. Also, Aristarchus, now pay attention to his name because it's going to come up later here in this letter. And Secundus of both of uh, Thessalonians and of Gaius of Deber, and then he lists Timothy and Tychicus and Tromephius of Asia. So Tychicus is from Ephesus originally. He more than likely got saved there under Paul's ministry, and then he joined Paul on his third missionary journey, and he was part of that contingent. If you remember, as Paul was going through the Asia Minor area, he was collecting uh, money, funds, for the church back in Jerusalem, which at this point 
was impoverished. And for, the, for a lot of it was starving because Rome was putting a tighter and tighter grip on that city as we we're heading into the, the 60 ADs, right around there, late 50s, early 60s. And we know by 70 AD is when Titus, the ruler of Rome, not the ruler, but the general of Rome, came into Jerusalem and finally conquered it and put the city, uh, burnt it to the ground. So they were feeling more and more of a pinch and Paul having a burden for his brethren back in Jerusalem where he used to minister as a Pharisee, by the way, now had such a heart for the church, was collecting money throughout the churches as saying, hey, give an offering back to the church there in Jerusalem. And Tychicus was one of the ones that, that, that carried this offering and he brought it, he traveled back to Jerusalem with Paul. After the Jerusalem assignment was done, Tychicus more than likely stayed with Paul. And so he would have been there. If you remember, Paul got arrested in Jerusalem, was sent to Caesarea by the sea, and then on from there to Rome. And Tychicus might have traveled with him for some of those parts, visited him while he was certainly in prison there in Caesarea. And we know now that he is with Paul here as he is under house arrest in Rome. He stood with Paul even in the face of danger and, and sometimes with the fear of death. Now we hear of Tychicus in some other places. Ephesians 6.21 says, But that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, I will make this all, will make this all known to you. So let's read here in verse 7, Paul's introduction to him to the Colossians as Tychicus will be carrying this letter. And as we mentioned earlier, Paul wrote four letters roughly at the same time, and they're all getting carried at the same time. The four letters are the letter to the Colossians that we have here before us, the letter to the Ephesians, which is why there are a lot of parallels in these two letters. There's a letter to Philemon, a personal letter to Philemon that we'll talk about in a minute, and then a letter to the Laodicean church that we don't have record of but it will get mentioned here at the end of the book. So four scrolls, if you will, of parchment that Tychicus will take with him. So verse 7 says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose that he may know your circumstance and comfort your hearts. You see, again, what I love about this is the, the heart of Paul. It amazes me. It never ceases to amaze me. Because Paul, unlike Jesus, is a human fallen in nature just like us. But being filled with the Holy Spirit and walking in the will of the Lord becomes such an incredible example of how we can and should live as fallen man, obeying God. And he had such a heart for the Colossian church that he had never visited. He didn't start the church there, and he had never visited. And yet, he wanted to send Tychicus not just to inform the Colossians about what was going on in Rome, but to get back from Tychicus news about how things were in Colossae. How were they going? Let, give me the details. I want to hear every little bit of, of, of who they are. Did you make a list of everybody in the church? I want to start praying for them. I could just hear Paul asking, on Tychicus' return, those kind of questions. But he sends him out, and his description of Tychicus really shows the confidence that Paul has in him. Uh, even as he says there in the second letter to Timothy, towards the end of his life, he's mentioning, I'm sending Tychicus to Ephesus. He had great confidence that Tychicus could be a good representation or representative, an ambassador of not only Paul, but of Christ. And so he uses these wonderful terms. First, he calls him a beloved brother, which basically means that Tychicus was like-minded with Paul, that he stayed even when things got difficult. He, he, he was there in, in that place of, of love and comfort for Paul when he needed him. It's a great example. He also calls him a faithful minister, and that is that Tychicus' love was displayed in action not just by word, not just, Paul, I'll be there for you and never show up. I, I don't know that you've ever been guilty of that, but I have been in the past. 
much to my own conviction, where you say, yes, I'm going to be there for you. And, and then m weeks and sometimes months go on and go by, and you haven't responded to that person like you hoped you would, and they're hoping, too, <laughs> that you'll come around. But Tychicus was there. He was, he was a faithful minister. I once heard someone say, the greatest ability in the world is dependability. Is it not? I love that. The greatest ability in the world is dependability. And certainly this man was dependable. He also calls him a fellow servant, that even though he wasn't an apostle himself, Tychicus assisted Paul in his apostolic ministry. So Paul then sends both Tychicus and um, Onesimus, who we're going to read about in just a moment here, to deliver the letters, like I said, to the Ephesians, the Colossians, the Laodiceans, and to Philemon. Let's throw the map up real quick, um, if we could, just so you get an idea of what their, their journey is going to be like. We use this map at the beginning to kind of show you where Colossae is compared to Rome. Now, these guys are here in Rome, and they're going to, by ship, more than likely sail down around uh, uh, Sicily here, and then on to through into this area, probably dock at Ephesus, deliver the first letter there, and then move on to Colossae, and then as it shows up here, kind of a blow up of that little area, as we mentioned earlier, the tri-cities here, Colossae, and then Laodicea, both here along the uh, Lycus River, and Hierapolis. So those three, um, the letter to the Ephesians obviously would be dropped off here. They would go on to Colossae, deliver not only the Colossian letter, but the letter to Philemon, who lived here, and the church met in his home, and then on to uh, Laodicea, and then back all the way again, at least um, Tychicus would, all the way back to Rome. So not exactly going next door. It was quite a jaunt for these men. And they had two duties. They were to deliver these letters, but they were also to tell the churches in Asia about Paul's situation, how things were going. And they also were to be Paul's eyes and ears, kind of that personal touch that Paul so longed to be able to do himself, but couldn't because he was incarcerated. He was under house arrest. I, I wonder how astonished Tychicus would have been on that day that he and Onesimus boarded onto that boat, that if for a moment he real, would realize that that satchel there on his side that contained those scrolls would literally outlast the Roman Empire, that they would be studied throughout ages, that they would be translated into thousands of languages, that they would be proclaimed among men for some 2,000 years to this day. He's just the messenger boy. He's just got a satchel full of scrolls. He's heard Paul dictate these things. It's a good thing he had no idea because it probably would have unnerved him to no end and to think that his name would be read all those eons later to even today. And yet he faithfully stepped onto that boat he and Onesimus, and were faithful to their duties. They delivered the letter. And we don't get any indication they faced any danger, but I can guarantee you if they did, they would give life and limb to make sure those letters got to where they were supposed to. Absolutely they would. But how amazing to think, just the suppression of Rome that was around them, and yet they carried the very thing that would outlast the Roman Empire and blast it right out of the, out of the sky. Being faithful in the little things, that's where Tychicus is a great example for us. Maybe God's given you just something small to do, and you might think it insignificant. You know, I really should be doing bigger and better things. Well, stay faithful to what God has put before you. Stay faithful to that little satchel that's right there on your side. Who knows what the Lord can do with that or what He will do? My goodness, if, if we were... If should the Lord tarry to see the things that the Lord did in and through us kind of played out throughout the eons, through the, our circle of influence, through our kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, 
I think we would be as blown away as Tychicus might have been. Well, enough of this, brother. Let's go on to the next one. Now the next is verse 9, Onesimus. We mentioned him already. So he's sending Tychicus with, verse 9, Onesimus, again, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. Now, Onesimus, uh, we called Tychicus the faithful. Onesimus, unfortunately, we have to title the fugitive. His name means profitable or useful. I like that. But the fact of the matter is, Onesimus had run away from his master Philemon. He was a slave to Philemon. And he had run away. We don't know at what point this had happened, whether Philemon was already saved, uh, if Onesimus was just rebellious and, and really wanted very little to do with this Jesus, this God that his master was now following. We're not sure. Or if before he was saved, maybe Philemon was a very harsh taskmaster. Uh, either way, Onesimus was prompted to, to run away, and he made his way to Rome, probably hoping that he could disappear in the massive city. What better place? The biggest city on earth at the time where he could I indeed just, just kind of fade in to the background. Because the fact of the matter is, as a runaway slave, he had a price on his head, and the shadow of the death of crucifixion that hovered over him continually, because that was the slave owner's right for a runaway slave was to crucify him. And they did that often with slaves because they wanted to make an example of them. And you know that, that crosses were lined up along the major roads and thoroughfares in Rome, and they would hang the people there. Very often, Jesus was really an exception. It would take them sometimes a day or two or even three days to die. So you can imagine trying to get to where you're going and these men that are just writhing in pain on these crosses and their, and their, their uh, offenses always written above their heads. Runaway slave. And I, and I can't imagine that there weren't those times that Onesimus pictured that in his mind. And yet, ironically enough, here he is in Rome and somehow he gets exposed to Paul and his ministry. And he gets radically saved. And look at what Paul says about, about him. Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Are you kidding me? It's, uh, he's a runaway slave. He's a, he's a convict, a fugitive. And yet, because of his faithfulness, he'd only been a believer for a very short time, yet he had already proven himself to Paul. And we see that in how Paul labels him. Now Paul is sending him back with Tychicus and Onesimus has a satchel too and it probably maybe it carries two of the four but for sure it carries one one letter that is a personal letter to his master his slave owner Philemon and he carries that with him he may well have heard Paul dictated but either way he is encouraged to go but not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. And, and, and Philemon is encouraged to forgive him. The very fact that Onesimus is willing to go back and face the music really indicates this new trustworthiness and faithfulness that he had in his life. Right? I mean, it's one thing to say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and I'm going to just stay here comfortable in Rome with Paul. I can minister to him. As a matter of fact, I might even get mentioned in, in the Bible. And he does. However, Paul encourages him, you need to go back and make things right. And he's willing to do it. Just for fun, turn with me over to the letter to Philemon. Just You want to keep going to the right and go past First and Second Timothy and Titus. And it's the next letter right there, Philemon. And I want to read just a, just a few verses of what Paul encourages Philemon to do in terms of this slave Onesimus. Look at verse 8 with me. In verse 8 it says, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command, what, uh, to, to command you what is fitting. So Paul's kind of setting it up like, um, I'm going to say something here. I want you to listen, Philemon. I may be going out on a limb. Verse 9, Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you 
being such a one as Paul, the aged, so I'm an old guy, you probably should listen to me or I'll get cranky, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now here's, here's his appeal. I appeal to you for my son, Onim, Onesimus. Can you believe he's calling him a son? Whom I have begotten while in chains. He was a spiritual son to Paul. 11, who once was profitable to you as a slave, but now is profitable to you and to me. In other words, he's been serving me. He's been meeting my needs. Verse 12, I am sending him back. You, therefore, receive him, that is, uh, my own heart. In other words, take him to yourself like I am visiting you myself through him. Verse 13, whom I wish to keep with me, I'd rather have him here, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. You're the owner. He's your slave. We need to make it right. It's up to you. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. I know Paul's kind of rubbing it in here, right? I, I want you to make this choice on your own, Philemon. But remember, I'm the one that led you to Christ. Just, just keep that in mind. And that now Onesimus is my spiritual son as well. Verse 15. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose. Paul is saying, you know, he's a runaway slave, but look what happened. He received Christ in the meantime, that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And then he goes on to encourage Philemon even more to forgive Onesimus and to receive him back. So that's the letter that Onesimus is, is carrying with him. And again, I'm sure his heart just filled with anticipation. What's going to happen? Both these men, Tychicus and Onesimus, had this dual ministry to encourage the Colossian Christians and to inform them about Paul's situation. Now, Paul wanted the Colossian saints to know about what he was going through for the sake of prayer, for the sake that they would pray for his situation, not not to try to use that trump card of, hey, I'm a poor man here in jail. No, that's not how Paul looked at it. So then Paul goes on and finishes out the letter with these greetings from six different men. And we'll go, we'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, three of them are Jews and three are Gentiles. So six different men. And he starts with the three Jewish believers. First, verse 10, uh, Aristarchus. And Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. Just a simple statement about him. But we know a little bit more. Now, we'll call Aristarchus the fearless. And there's a reason for that. His name means, by, by the way, the best ruler. The best ruler. Now, Aristarchus is originally from Thessalonica. We read that back in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. And he joined Paul again, same time, on his third missionary journey. But for sure we know that he was willing to risk his life for Paul because Aristarchus got caught up in the Ephesian riots. Look at what it says. Listen to what it says in Acts 19, verse 29. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. So they got caught up in this, this riot that happened there in Ephesus. If you remember, there was this period of time for, I don't know, I can't remember offhand how long, hours, where they screamed about Dionys Dionysus of Ephesus. They, they screamed out this false god's name. And it, it got the mob in such a fervor that this riot ensued. And Paul was quickly ushered out and ushered away. But some were caught up in it. And Aristarchus was one of them. And yet he was willing to do so. Now you would think, that after that had happened, he would say, you know what? Uh, I think I've done my thing for the Lord and for Paul. I'm going to go my own way. I I'll go minister the gospel somewhere else. But he doesn't. He stays with Paul. He even accompanies Paul to Greece. And from there goes back to Asia Minor. As we already read there in uh, Acts 20 verse 4. But he then, once Paul is arrested in Jerusalem, sails with Paul to Rome which means that he endured the same storm that Paul endured and the same shipwreck that Paul endured, ended up on the island of Malta, all of that journey together 
As a matter of fact, Acts 27, verse 2 says, So entering a ship at the Adremitim, uh, Ad anyway, that's where the ship was from, <laughs> we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. And the us is, because Luke is writing this, so Luke was there, Paul was there, those are the us, but this Aristarchus, the fearless, was with them as well. He was willing to share Paul's confinement even. Notice that it says here, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. Now, we don't know that that literally means that Aristarchus was in chains, but we do know it means this. When they got to Rome and the traveling was over and they started shackling Paul to these chains in this house, where he would be between or shackled to a Roman guard continually. I'm sure Aristarchus was told at this point, all right, go your way. You're done. And his comment to that was, uh-uh, I'm with him. I'm staying. If you need to shackle me, then shackle me. But I'm staying. I'm staying by Paul's side. So Paul calls him or considers him this, this fellow prisoner, an amazing man. Then he mentions not just Aristarchus, fellow prisoner, but with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Now, we know of Mark, and Mark's gone back and forth, poor guy. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll call Mark the forgiven, because he certainly was by Paul. His name means a defense. Marcus means a defense. Now, Mark was from Jerusalem. We know that. His mother, as a matter of fact, owned the home that was the meeting place of the early church. He was Barnabas' cousin, as it even mentions here. But Mark had caused a great problem and division in Paul's ministry. If you recall, Mark went along on the first missionary journey. But as soon as things started getting rough, he bailed. He was their, their assistant. He probably took care of all the traveling arrangements and suddenly left both Paul and Barnabas in the lurch as he just went back to Jerusalem. He'd, he'd had enough. It was too much for him. We don't know exactly what hit him, but he was fearful enough to quit in the middle and go home. Well, when the second missionary journey was getting ready to take place, Barnabas says, let's go get Mark. Let's bring him along. Let's give him another chance. And Paul says, uh-uh, I'm not going to take that risk again. So Barnabas then goes with Mark to Cyprus. They minister there for a while, and they eventually end up back in Jerusalem where Mark hooks up again with Peter. And from what we believe is there that Peter really ministered and discipled Mark to where uh, he not only became a mature Christian that Paul later recognized, and now Mark is here with Paul in Rome, but Mark ends up writing the second gospel that we have in our Bibles, more than likely dictated to him by Peter. So it's, in a sense, Peter's gospel written by, by Mark, by John Mark. So there's this great division, but Paul forgives him. As a matter of fact, in 2 Timothy 4.11, when Paul's there at the end of his life, Mark probably has gone on, but Timothy now says, as he's there in the Mamertine prison, about to be beheaded, says, Luke is only, only Luke is with me. He says to Tim Timothy, you get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So Mark had proven himself. But the thing was, there was a strong stigma still hanging over Mark's head. Oh yeah, Mark, he's the deserter. He's the one that left. He's the one that walked away. And that's why Paul instructs here in, in the parentheses, in verse 10, about whom you received instructions. In other words, I've already told you, I've forgiven him, and when Mark comes your way, you receive him. You accept him. Don't let this, this stigma, this rumor that's going on about him precede him there. It's over. It's forgiven. Isn't it sad very often when we allow ourselves to be influenced by the things we hear about people before we meet them? Have you ever noticed when someone influences you and maybe talks your ear off about somebody? Oh, this and that, and can you believe they? And oh, my goodness, and I can't even stand them anymore. And then you finally get a chance to meet them. And you already have this whole stigma you're going to deal with, and hopefully not too heavy of a preconceived notion. 
But then you start talking to them, you find out, well, I, I don't see that at all. They seem to be an okay person, or they're actually wonderful. And you've been misled by that, that preconceived notion. Well, it was a thing that Mark did, so he did have that reputation, but he got himself together. And he even was able, like I said, to be used by the Lord to re write one of the Gospels. But Mark is a great encouragement to all of us who have failed at those first attempts. And I know there's a few in the room, probably, including myself, that could nod ahead to that. Yeah, I've, I've had some first attempts in my ministry to the Lord and my walking with God that have been failures. But look at what Mark did. He didn't put his head down and just disappear into oblivion. He stayed at it. And so much so that it got Paul's attention and those two were reconciled in a great way. It's interesting. Barnabas is never called back. But Mark is. Mark is. Uh, then the last fellow Hebrew in verse 11, and Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision, and they have proved to be a comfort to me. So this man, Jesus, and it makes sense that he would be uh, go by the other known name that he had, Justice. But Jesus was a very common name in this day. Uh, it's not like he was stealing <laughs> anything. He was named this as a baby. That's why throughout the Gospels, very often, Jesus, our Savior, is identified as Jesus of what? Nazareth, right? To kind of segregate him from all the other Jesuses that were out there. No, this is the Jesus of Nazareth, the one that was Joseph, the carpenter's son. As there's a lot of little ways that he is identified specifically to set that name apart. Well, here we have a Jesus whose name was also Justice. Now, it, you probably can figure out what his name means. It means just, <laughs> to be just. But uh, Justice was the friendly. And we don't know anything more about this, name, this man but what is written right here. And Ju Jesus, who is called Justice, period. That's all we know. That's it. But you know what, what he represents? He represents all of those people that are willing to serve God and never be noticed. That are willing to do it in the background, to behind the scenes, faithfully serving God, whose deeds go absolutely unannounced. That was justice. He was, he was a servant to Paul, but didn't stand out in any other way. And he was absolutely content with that. And finishing off this little verse here, Paul was so blessed that these these Jewish believers, these Christians that were of the circumcision, notice he, he makes that very clear. These guys are of the circumcision. They, they were solid Jews before they became Christians. They proved to be a comfort to me. Can you imagine? I mean, if you think about it, what was Paul's, or who rather, was Paul's greatest opposition? It was the Judaizers, wasn't it? The Jews, the, the staunch Judaizers that said, and came along and said, okay, this Christian thing is fine, but if you're going to be a Christian, you have to become a Jew first. That's what the Judaizers mostly did. You need to go ahead and get circumcised and follow all the tenets of the law of Moses. And once you've done all of that, then you can consider this Christian thing in Jesus. But you become a Jew first. That's why they, Paul fought against them so much, because he was saying, no, that's not why Christ died. He, he tore the veil from top to bottom so that all men could have access into the throne of God. He shed His blood for all mankind. And there doesn't need to be these rules and regulations and these ceremonies that have to happen first. It's available on the spot to anyone who will open up their hearts to the Lord. So it was a real blessing for him to have these three men, Aristarchus, Marcus, and Justice, who were of the circumcision, and yet believers with him. Well, then he goes on in verse 12 to introduce or give greetings from three Gentiles, the next three. The next one we know, we've mentioned his name often as we've studied through this letter, Epaphras, verse 12 and 13. Epaphras, who is one of you, so he's a fellow Colossian, a bondservant of Christ greets you. 
always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear wit him witness that he has a great zeal for you and for those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. So Paul now is commending to and sending greetings from Epaphras. Now, interesting, Epaphras is sending greetings. Wouldn't he be the one to carry the letter? Wouldn't he be the one, the logical one, to take back this letter to the Colossians? Well, the first thing that Paul describes about him is that he's a bondservant of Christ. The fervor that Epaphras had for Christ had manifested itself in self-sacrificing service. And somehow along the way, one of two things happened. Either Epaphras was so bonded to Paul and cared so much for his welfare that he said, you know what, I need to stay here. I feel God calling me to stay here. Or, like Aristarchus, he might have said, if Paul's in prison, then I'm in prison. Because over in the letter to Philemon, in verse 23, Paul identifies Epaphras this way. He says, Epaphras, again, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus greets you. So we get this sense again that Epaphras, either by choice or maybe somewhere along the way, he actually himself got arrested for his own fervor in the Lord, became a fellow prisoner with Paul. So in a sense, he couldn't go back. But in the meantime, he had great fervor. And here's what st uh, stuck out for Paul in terms of the kind of man Epaphras was. He was a man of prayer. Epaphras the fervent. Paul was able to observe his prayers. If, if Epaphras was with him there in the room, isolated in this, this place where he's imprisoned, then if any time pa Epaphras prayed, it would have been to Paul's witness. He would have seen it with his own eyes. So what about Epaphras's prayer life? Well, for one thing, he prayed constantly, right? Epaphras, who is one of you, bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayer. So his prayer was always, it was constant. Not just when he felt like it or needed it, he always and constantly prayed. What a great example. His prayer was fervent, like it says here. Fervently, laboring fervently. That, that whole idea of agonizing in prayer. It wasn't a casual thing for Epaphras to, to get down on his knees and, and just lift up a few petitions to the Lord. He did so with great fervor and, and, and laboring. He, he took it seriously. And at times, I'm sure, he cried out to God on behalf of these Colossian believers and those in Laodicea and Hierapolis that, 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 that just needed so God's touch. His prayer was personal. He's praying for you, these fervent prayers for you. Like I said, Colossae, and as we see here, Laodicea, Hierapolis, this whole tri-city area. Uh, you've got to know that while Epaphras was here, he ministered to these cities. Yeah, the church was going well in Philemon's house as he pastored there, but there were believers in Laodicea. We'll read about it in a moment. And they're in Hierapolis. And, and so he prayed. He prayed personally for them. But he also prayed specifically. Look at what it says at the second half of the verse. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Isn't that a great prayer that we could pray for each other? I'm going to pray for you right now that you could stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's a, that's a great encouragement that we can give to one another. What a, what a practical um, blessing to put on to somebody. So he prayed specifically, and he also prayed sacrificially. I bear witness that he has great zeal. In other words, Paul is saying, uh, another way you could translate that is much distress. Paul was saying, as I observe that Paphras praying, as he's there in all fervency and laboring for you, specifically you in Colossae and Laodicea and Hierapolis, he's doing so sacrificially. He has such zeal that he's putting us, I'm watching him put aside his own meals. He's, he's skipping through food to continue to pray. He's skipping through nights of sleep to continue to pray. Paul saw his great zeal that he had 
for these people. And it blessed his heart. So Epaphras, the fervent. Then in verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 14, a man that we're very familiar with, another greeting from the second Gentile, Luke, the beloved physician. Um, Luke was not only a physician, but a historian. We know a lot about this guy. He read, I'm sorry, wrote probably, I haven't done it yet, but I, may, I think maybe adding up verses, he may have writ, written more of the New Testament than anybody else, and he was a Gentile because he wrote all of the Gospel of Luke and he wrote the book of Acts. Those are both pretty long books. So Luke, as a physician, always also was a great reporter. He was a man of detail, so he was able to write down all of the things that happened. Uh, and with great detail, especially his gospel. Uh, it's the longest of the three gospels, the most detailed. As a physician, he approaches it that way. It's a, the most um, accurate and detailed description of the crucifixion is in the gospel of Luke. But isn't it interesting that Paul needed him a lot because Paul was not a well man. He had been beaten and battered he had been sick for long periods of time, right? I think he was in uh, uh, Corinth for a long period of time because of illness. So he benefited greatly from having a doctor on his team. And Luke stuck with him, and Luke ministered to him as a physician. Don't you find it ironic? Paul had the power to heal people, and yet he traveled with a doctor. Doesn't that kind of put a little bit of a stint in those faith healing people? Like, all you got to do is have enough faith, and you can be healed. Well, here's Paul. <laughs> he had the power to heal. We see several examples of that in the Bible. Paul healing people. But he traveled with a doctor. He himself knew that there were those times when God heals practically and other times he heals miraculously. Then this man Demas is mentioned. They're just at the tail end, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greets you. Demas rather unfortunate. We'll call Demas the flounderer. Uh, his name means governor of the people. Not really sure why. By the way, Luke or Lucas means light giving. Light giving. I like that. But Demas, you know, it's interesting. Paul had something praiseworthy to say about every one of these men. Have you noticed? Beloved brother, Epaphras, a prayer warrior. Luca, Lucas or Luke, the great, the great physician, greets you. But he has... He has nothing praiseworthy to say about Demas. And I, I wonder if Paul already sensed a lack of commitment in him. Because way at the end, and the way it ended up for Demas, is a rather sad commentary. Here is what Paul says about him, again in 2 Timothy. That, that's the letter that Paul wrote just before he was beheaded from the Mamertine prison. And in chapter 4, verse 10 of 2 Timothy, Paul writes this, Be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. There's a sad commentary. Demas, who was doing so well, who was right there with Paul, had all the same advantages of being able to minister with this man, but also hear the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word from Paul. And yet... He didn't just kind of drift away. As Paul says to Timothy, he has departed, forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know, Christians today, far too often, it's sad that we see them succumb to the things of the world. They, they drift back, just like demons. And how easy it is, even sometimes, for those to stay around the church. Demas was still here with Paul. Paul may have already been sensing something. He sends a greeting from Demas, but later on, Demas does indeed leave. But not just leave, forsake. He, he turned his back. So it's easy to keep that r religious veneer at times when actually living for the things of the world has taken over and become more important to us. And for us, we need to be willing to reach out to those. We need to be willing to give a loving hand back into the fold to those that have wandered and strayed. Well, in verse 15, 
Um, that was the three, by the way, the three Gentiles that send greeting. Now Paul's going to do some greetings of his own. Uh, verse 15, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in his house. Uh, so here's this Nymphus character. He's the only believer in Laodicea that we know by name. His name means bridegroom, really not significant to anything. But what we do know about him is that he had opened up his home and that the church in Laodicea was meeting there in his home. And Paul, again, having such a heart for this area because of Epaphras and seeing the fervor he had, just kind of went right along the ride and, and gives this greeting. I'm sure Epaphras is the one that informed Paul about this church and the situation that was going on there. So Nymphus is mentioned. Um, then, Paul in verse 16, as we're, we're coming to a close here, kind of, again, warns the Colossians, not warns them, but gives them a little instruction, and that is, make sure that you share. I, I can almost see, like in his fatherly way, you know, kind of kind of wrapping that finger. Now, you guys make sure you share. Verse 16, now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is also read in the church of, of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. This is how we know there was a fourth letter that was written that Tychicus and Onesimus were carrying with them. The Ephesian letter, the Colossian letter, the letter to Philemon, and this one that's mentioned. What happened to this letter, we do not know, and we don't worry about it because God chose not to have it in the canon of Scripture. It might have been an exact repeat or copy of another. Either way, it doesn't matter, but Paul's encouragement is, hey, listen, there are some truths in your letter that the people in Laodicea can benefit from, and there are some truths in theirs that you need to glean as well. Don't hoard this stuff for yourself. Don't just keep it there to yourself, but share it. Share it with one another. We've been given the keys to the kingdom, haven't we? Didn't Jesus say to Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom? And with that confession you have of me, Peter, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, that not even the gates of hell are going to prevail against that? So now from that point on, we as the church have the keys. We hold them. The keys to life, to truth, to salvation. And if we don't share that, with those around us, then we're being guilty as Paul is encouraging. Hey, share the truth. Share the word with others. Don't just keep or hoard it for yourselves. Well, then, verse 17, he says, And say to um, Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Now, Archippus was Philemon's son. And he was to carry on the work, especially since Epaphras, who was the pastor there, more than likely put Archippus in, uh, um, told him, you be the pastor. You, you now take over. I'm going to be gone for a good long period of time. Again, traveling all the way from here to Rome it was going to take a while, and then who knows how long that would take. And as we see, Epaphras decided to stay. So now in the letter, Paul is encouraging him, hey, listen, there's a ministry which you've received, which has been given to you by the Lord. Through your mentor, Epaphras, be faithful to that. Be true to it. Fulfill it in every way. As the son of Philemon, who, whose home the church met in, and his mother there, Apphia, as a matter of fact, in Philemon, verse 1 and 2, we're introduced to them. To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, and to beloved Apphia, his wife, and our... Um, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. But Paul reminds him of something very important, and that is that your, your gift, your ministry, was from God. It was a gift from God. And if God gave it to you, then he is also going to help you to carry it out and to do so in the right way. And that's something we all need to be reminded of constantly. If God has gifted us in a certain way, if God has called us to a certain thing, if He has given us that gift of our ministry, then we also need to trust that He's going to be there every step of the way, and He will see us through. He will carry us to the end. He will bring it to completion. Philippians 1, verse 6. For He who has begun a good work in you will see it through to completion. He's faithful 
to complete it through Christ Jesus. Paul was encouraging Archippus, stay true, but lean on God. Keep going, but know where your strength comes from. Isn't it neat that these are words of instruction and encouragement all at once? Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. In other words, he's commanding him, be sure you fulfill it, but he's also encouraging him. The Lord's going to be with you to fulfill it. Great words of encouragement. Well, Paul's final goodbye in verse 18. He says, This salutation by my own hand, Paul. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. You see, Paul dictated his letters for the most part. Uh, a lot of people believe that uh, his vision was very, very bad by now. Could have been from the stoning um, that he endured there outside of Lystra. We don't know for sure. But he did dictate a lot of his letters. Could be that it was just easier to kind of free flow with it and speak it out as someone was quickly writing it down. But for Paul, as he finished, as he gave this final encouragement to Archippus, decided, you know what, I need to sign this myself. And as he sat down at the table and lifted his arm, and that shackle dug into his wrist again, reminding him of the pain and the rawness that had developed over the months and months that he had been imprisoned. And as he lifted his arm to grab the stylus from whoever was dictating, and that chain dragged across the table, hearing that thing clang, clang, clang across and scratching even the table as he grabbed the stylus and start to write salutation by my own hand. Paul, hearing those chains once again, he just th throws in a quick reminder. By the way, remember. Remember the fact that I'm shackled here. But I'm sure for Paul, as he looked down at those chains, as he looked down at that shackle on his raw wrist, as he watched his own hand write his name in salutation, it probably put a smile on his face because he remembered why those chains are there. It was for the sake of the very Gentiles that he was writing this letter to because he believed so that the Gentiles could come to Christ, that they didn't need to be a Jew first, that he was put in prison. That was the reason. It was for the mystery of Christ that he had been incarcerated, that the Jews had brought these accusations against him, that gave him the need to appeal to Caesar and ended him up here in Rome. So those were good chains. Yes, he was frustrated because he would rather be out there ministering, but like we mentioned before, I'm sure Paul realized that with the, with the palace guard getting saved, if he were a free man, he wouldn't be able to reach some of the people that he was reaching now. And because of his chains and these letters that were going out and the encouragement that they were going to bring, it warmed his heart to know that it was for the sake of the gospel brought to the Gentiles that he was imprisoned. We need to remember as well, don't we, our modern day prisoners for the gospel Saeed Abedini still in prison his condition is still pretty bad it's been a very long time his family has been without him we need to keep him and his family in our prayers and I'm sure there are many others that maybe we don't know about as well or not as public there are people that live around the world that are persecuted like you can't believe We've gotten some examples of that with what we see happening with ISIS. Pray for those. Those that are in chains, maybe not literally, but they've been bound by the evil of the world, and yet they stay true to their faith. You know what, though? No matter what the circumstances, the bottom line is still God's grace. And that's how Paul ends it. Grace be with you. Amen. So, as he says in this letter... You know him, now walk with him. You know him, now walk with him. Um, in closing, it's kind of ironic that uh, I named this uh, study Goodbye for Now. You might have seen that on the slide earlier. Um, it's rather apropos. I, I picked this study months ago when I was outlining the whole book. 
but um, I'm going to be stepping literally down <laughs> from the, uh, the, the, the stool for a, a little bit. Uh, Pastor, we're going to give Pastor Chris uh, McCulloch an opportunity to come and teach you guys for a while, and he's going to be teaching the book of 2 Corinthians to you on Sunday nights for a bit. So um, he'll be here next week. Um, so uh, I've, I've had a great time being with you guys, and I'll probably be back. Uh, who knows what the Lord's going to do? But uh, uh, what, a, what a neat way to end this book. Um, goodbye for now. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll still be here. We'll be here on Sunday nights, and uh, we'll be worshiping with you. And maybe I'll be a, a help Tom out some with worship on Sunday nights and that kind of thing. So you know him. Let's all walk with him. Amen? Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for your love and for your mercy, for your grace that not only just permeates and, and, and oozes through your word, bleeds through every page, literally, but we are so thankful for how you called men, especially men like Paul, to be so diligent and faithful to write these letters, these epistles that not only were a, a great benefit and help to those early churches, but still ring true today. And, and I'm still kind of just blown away by these, these faithful servants of Paul's, Tychicus and, and the Onesimus, just getting on the boat and faithfully taking the letters to where they were to go. And here we sit tonight, all this time later, still learning, still gleaning, still having your word living and breathing in our lives, having it be sharper than any two-edged sword, able to literally separate bone from marrow, soul from spirit. So, Lord, let your word cut deep into our lives, into our hearts. And may we not only hear it and live by it, but perform it, Lord, do it. Help every one of us, as Paul encouraged the Colossian church, to walk with you, to put feet on our faith, and in every way, Lord, we would walk in your grace. If you'd like to have prayer tonight, if you'd like to uh, have uh, one of our elders or pastors that are up front spend a little time with you, encouraging you, praying, maybe getting a word of instruction from the things that you're sharing, opening up God's word together, and seeing what he has for you, then don't hesitate. Come up and spend a little time afterwards. You don't have to rush off. Uh, it's still early. Uh, you can spend some time praying together as well as before you leave. And just those folks that are around you there. Take some time to fellowship. Don't be loners. Don't just come and sit and listen. But stretch out a hand. I know our church is big. But if you put your hand out and someone else takes it, now there's only two people in the church, you and that person. And you can have fellowship together. So minister to one another, love one another, be prayed for. And let's all go out with great joy into what God has for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.